Welcome everybody. Whoa, welcome everybody. I'm delighted to have you all here tonight. It's a very, very special night. I am Mirko Bischofberger. I show my face once before I hide behind the mask. Uh, for those of you who know me, I'm the head of communication of EPFL, but I'm also used to be a scientist, a life scientist, and I love movies. And this evening is very special because it combines all the three elements. And uh, not only this, it's a very special evening also because we are watching a wonderful movie, Genesis 2.0, in the presence of Christian Frey, who's here with us. I'll give him the word later. Christian Frey is a Swiss filmmaker, and uh, inside the movie, he, he, there is protagonists, as in every movie. One of the protagonists is George Church, a professor from MIT and Harvard, who will also be with us later. And inside the movie, there's also the iGEM, the International Genetic Engineered Machine Competition, and the students should also be here with us tonight. So many things are combined in this movie, and many people are present. This makes this evening very special. And the fourth thing makes this evening very special. It's one of the first bigger events that we do at EPFL again after the lockdown of Switzerland. So I really trust on you that you keep your masks on, you keep the distances. You heard what happened at the Ecole Hotelier in Lausanne, unfortunately. So I hope this is not the last event we have to do. Okay, now for something lighter. I would like to ask a moment Martin Fetterli, our president, to give a welcome word, and I'll see you later again. Thank you very much, Mirko. Well, it's great to be here. It's true, it's the first real event I see in a long time at EPFL. I hope indeed that it's not a, a flash in the pan, that we manage these events in such a way that we can have more of these. As you know, this is a new normal, and. Uh, I apologize, but I think that's the best way that we can move forward and potentially have more events like this. So I would like to welcome everybody in the name of EPFL, Christian Frey, of course, George Church later. I would like to welcome the members. There are several team members of the iGEM competition, and the 2019 team actually was the worldwide winner, right? Fantastic. Bravo again. And. Um, I would like to say just a few words about these type of events. So I think the role of universities is to be an open place for debates, okay? And the debates about science in particular, science is pushing frontiers, and very clearly George Church is a man who is pushing frontiers. This doesn't leave everybody uh, at ease, okay? Because like other people who are pushing frontiers, you know, this can be controversial, but I think here is a place to actually discuss this. And uh, we have had other events in this vein. We had uh, Yuval Harari. Everybody knows Yuval Harari, of course, rock star, uh, if, there is, uh, if there is one. Um, that was a great event, very interesting. There was an event with Ed Winters, who promotes veganism. When we proposed the event, there were some people on campus said, how can you invite somebody who promotes veganism, right? And, uh, you know, the room was packed, the guy was great, and he wasn't preaching. He was just explaining why he was actually a vegan, and, uh, you know, that's a fine line of uh, <laughs> pursuit as well. Uh, tonight, I think it's very special because it combines, um, you know, the first public event, as was mentioned. It combines science and it combines filmmaking, storytelling. And, um, I, you know, of course, I interact quite a bit with uh, Mirko, the head of communications, and we always discuss this question of storytelling. Um, so science is actually also storytelling. I mean, I'm more on the mathematical side, where you would think, you know, puts the axiom and, you know, just derives a darn theorem. And it's true, it's less, in mathematics, it's less about storytelling, but most other science is also about storytelling. Getting people excited, why the question is interesting, why the approach you have taken is actually the right approach, why the result is actually exciting. And in that sense, I, I love this idea that we have the screening of a documentary about one of the you know, great scientists uh, in the biological domain, George Church. And I thank you everybody for having come and to stick to the rules as uncomfortable as they may be. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Martin, for your words. I'll just briefly go through the program tonight. Maybe next slide. Okay, so first I will introduce Christian Frey, director. He will briefly introduce the movie. We will watch the movie together. Afterwards, we have a discussion, first with Christian Frey, then with George Church, and then with Professor De Planke and the students of the iGEM competition. 
And then there is an open mic which stands there for all of you to ask questions. For hygiene reasons, there's only one mic, so you can't pass it on, and nobody touches the same mic twice. So you come to the mic later, you ask your question, and then you should go back to your place. Okay, next slide, just to introduce the people. Briefly, I'll go more in detail in a minute. On the left, you see Christian Frey, the director, who's sitting there. On top right, you see Professor Bart de Planke, who's a professor at EPFL and one of the founders of the iGEM competition here at EPFL, the team who participated. At the bottom, you see the winning team of iGEM, together with Professor Merkel on the left, Luc Gabel, Laura Emilia kvedaraus Kaite, Jun Yan Qian, Theo Nas, Konstantinos Rajos, and Shi Yu Cheng and Chun Ye Tsai. Okay, next slide. Then George Church will be with us later, as said. Maybe no need to introduce him right now. And I think that's it. That's the program again of tonight. So and without further ado, now I would like to introduce Christian Frey. I'm a, about 40. When I was 20, I went to cinema in Zurich. Uh, there's a very nice cinema called the Xenix in Zurich. And uh, they, they show always the best movies. And so I went to see a movie which was called War Photographer. I still remember each scene of that movie. It's a very touching black and white movie of a very famous photographer, James Nachtwey, who is a war photographer. He goes into the war scene. And this documentary was actually made by Christian Frey. So the name Christian Frey was always in my head because I like movies. Last year, I, I went to a coffee in Zurich next to my place, and I see Christian Frey sitting at a table. He was reading the NZ set. So I dared to go closer and asked him, hey, I saw your movie, and I saw so Genesis 2.0, and what about coming once over to EPFL? And so he said yes, so thanks a lot for being with us. Christian Frey studied at Uni Fribourg. He's a, an Oscar-nominated director, right? He's really top level. He used to be the president of the Commission for Documentaries in Switzerland. He's the president of the Film Academy. What more? Christian Frey, thanks so much for being with us. <laughs> Well, thank you, Mirko. I'm really very excited to be here. It's the first event, I think, Corona, post, post Corona. Well, I'm actually not going to introduce the film so much because the film should introduce itself, but I will tell you about this book, Regenesis, very close to the film title, by George Church. I think. I, it was five years ago when I was reading it, and it was triggered by the second title, How Synthetic Biology Will Reinvent Nature and Ourselves. I was really thinking, wow, this is big. And it really inspired me to do this film. Don't expect a film about the book. That's impossible. Don't expect a film about synthetic biology with all the aspects. You will see what the film is about. It's a mammoth film and something even bigger behind the mammoth. So I hope you enjoy this journey. And I'm very much looking forward to meet you. And then, of course, also George Church, because I haven't seen him, I think, for four years when we were shooting. And I hope you like this journey. Thanks so much, Christian. For those who are online, the movie will not be streamed, so we will watch it here in the room. You can watch it on all available platforms, and we will see you later after the movie for the discussion. Enjoy the movie. It's working? Yes, perfect. Thanks so much. This was an amazing adventure. It's incredibly poetic, aesthetic, critical, and informative. What can we want more? So I would like to start now the discussion. First, I'll start with you, Christian, right away. Like, how did you get to the idea to do this movie, to cross all oh, these I topics? See, I see Dr. Church. Hello. He's, yes, Already but he's they don't see me. Hello. <laughs> Already. Well, you know, I told you how I started actually his book, you know, Regenesis, but of course that was not the moment when I had the idea to do a movie. 
there, it was needed another thing. While I was reading the chapter about the resurrection of the woolly mammoth, I came across photographs by Evgenia Arbogeva, you know, the sister of Maxim, my co-director and wonderful cinematographer. And at that moment, when I saw these photographs of this Mad Max atmosphere on these islands, to, you know, the search for these tusks, these islands which look more like a primordial earth, and then Dr. Church's book, which is the future, I had an epiphany. I knew this is the next four years of my life. I have to sit down in these moments because this is kind of overwhelming. And I was just sure, yes, this is the film. And then, of course, it was complicated to organize everything. Lucky I found Maxim, you know, because he's really a kid of the Arctic. He knows how to behave there. And then we embarked on this journey. And uh, it turns out this was a pure coincidence that the two were brothers, the, the, the director of the Mammoth Museum and the hunter. And Peter, that yes. Was a I have to tell you a very sad thing. Semyon, the director of the Mammoth Museum, he passed away this year, much too young, with two young children. So I'm very sorry. I kind of dedicate this first screening after he passed away to him. Um, yes, I mean, they're very different, these two brothers, and of course I like both of them. You know, Peter, I mean, you know, he's kind of a guy who also reflects on this, not esoteric, but on this myth and taboo side of, this, of on the islands. And, and I like him a lot. And of course, uh, you know, Semyon was the key then also to, to get me to Korea, you know, with Dr. Kwong, because his wife Lena and Dr. Kwong are working together. And that brought me to Korea, and then Dr. Kwong brought me to Shenzhen, to China, to BGI. So I was really lucky to finally, um, you know, kind of conclude this trip, which I didn't foresee at the beginning everything. The only thing which I could plan at the beginning is the, you know, the synthetic biology part with iGEM and the Jamboree. So the, the movie depicts uh, in a beautiful manner all kinds, uh, the, the two extremes, let's say, the hopes for a better life and at the same time the, the fears of a dystopia. So, of course, you, you take a side here and it's also a, a, a storytelling. So what's your personal take on, on this? How do you see this evolving? Well, a movie like that, I mean, this is an epic movie. It obviously is not a film about synthetic biology in terms of a balanced film where you have pros and contrasts, where you have to include all the aspects. It was never my intention to do that. You know, this is a mammoth film. And uh, so I just, I mean, I was fascinated just to, to do this mix of, of Mad Max and Jurassic Park. And I, what I want is to trigger something. On the other hand, of course, I mean, I want to do my job well. I want to do a film which is based on research, which is accurate. But you are a scientist, and it's really not easy, you know, to bring down the complexity of, of scientific thinking uh, to a film. And also, of course, it was a huge challenge. In this film, you can see, as a filmmaker, you know, the, of course, the islands have been a paradise. You see the emotions of these guys, all this testosterone, you know, how they drive around, their, their fears, their joys, and it's immediately visible what's going on, and of course not in the labs. And that's why I was so happy to work at iChem first and then with Dr. Church, because it was a challenge to kind of do the same in the labs, which I tried to do on the islands, to do a visual you know, a strong movie, which is also a kind of an entertaining and, and which, is, which is strong, you know. So, because when you guys see the results on a screen, which is maybe a number, and you're very excited, for me as a filmmaker, this is a huge problem because I, I don't understand anything. <laughs> That's your number and you, you have your joy. So it's, 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 it's important, you know, that we kind of work together because for me, science is kind of doing the same thing like we artists do. We embark to the unknown, we break boundaries. And Dr. Church is really uh, saying a very important phrase, you know, we humans, we do like to embark into the unknown, 
into dangerous parts, and that's just part of us. And for me, this is a very important phrase also within the film. Because, of course, somehow I really tried to balance this film, you know, I mean, you know, for example, I didn't want to mix up everything, you know, as you know, of course, cloning and synthetic biology and engineering the genome, that's two very different worlds. And this is not so easy to, 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 to tell a non-scientist audience, and I really tried hard to, to make it accurate, you know. I think you managed very well to create this, uh, this image also poetically of embarking into the unknown, right? Also with the waters, the frontiers of knowledge, but also geographically, the hopes of people. But so by this, there is this uh, very key moment where the, the, the lady in the BGI Institute, of course, by touching frontiers, you also touch ethics, right? And then there is this key moment where she's, she doesn't know what to reply about uh, eliminating Down syndrome babies. So. Yeah, I mean, the digitization of life, you know, where is it going from now? And I know you have your standards and I totally trust you, what you're doing here. And I also trust the Chinese, don't get me wrong. It's just, I do feel at that moment, I'm, as a filmmaker, a seismograph. You know, because the question this guy is actually asking is a very simple one maybe insurance companies could be interested in our genomes because you see the risk coming, you see the, you know, everything coming. And her answer, which is there is no edit, and there is no cut between, it's a pan, so it's the real answer, is no, even better, we can get rid of uh, Down syndrome. I mean, I have a handicapped sister, and I feel life and, the, you know, in its expression also includes people in all varieties of, of, of human beings also with handicaps, of course. I mean, this fantasy or this, this will to eliminate Down syndrome, for me, it's really scary. And also it's Dr. Olson's uh, reaction. So, I mean, I was very lucky actually with Dr. Olson because <laughs> Dr. Kwong wanted to introduce him also just to show how much he's into cloning and successful and I was actually very very afraid of this shoot at BGI because I knew well they will present their company I mean as you would present Nestle or Nespresso or whatever and and of course I talked with Dr. Olsen and I found out well I mean this guy is a scientist he likes science he, he likes to be a scientist but he will he has questions and he will also raise them and of course as soon as he raised the questions they really approached him immediately uh, I could hear it on the microphones shut up and don't you ask any more of these questions and and but you know it's not that i feel that bgi is doing a wrong thing i just feel us artists filmmakers we have to raise questions at that very early moment because this again you know you embark into uh, how many fifth or sixth industrial revolution i mean this is a big thing the potentially when you bring down the genomes into the computers, you, the computers will, I think, I mean, from my point of view, they will understand more and more about the complexity of life. And then, you know, to be able to engineer that, to kind of edit a genome like I'm editing a film, let's just raise the questions now. I think that's the message of the film. That leads me perfect to the next question. To what extent do you think uh, our movie is also a way to ethically discuss science, right? I mean, this is about science. Your other movies were not about science, let's say. So do you think uh, movies have a role in discussing ethical issues also uh, in a critical way, as you just do? Is this something that is coming more and more? Is this something... I think it's quite rare. That's why I'm asking, probably. Yes, but I mean, now I, I, I just tell you something maybe you would not expect. Nowadays, among filmmakers, there's more a tendency just to feed the fears. <laughs> we are in the midst of a pandemic, and I really, and probably my next film, I hope I can shoot it in, at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and it will be, of course, a scientific film. So don't get me wrong, we do have to raise the questions, but on the other hand, we shouldn't just feed the fears, because some of the reactions with the audiences all over the world, also with Genesis, I was actually, you know, if I would have seen myself on, on the stage doing the Q&As, I was really, you know, kind of 
changing the side and, and saying, well, but hello, no, 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 no. I mean, synthetic biology will bring a lot of good stuff and they will develop, you know, uh, drugs to heal us. And so I, I was almost kind of put, put a little bit backslashing from my own message. But I felt when I was finishing the film that this is the right thing and we have all the sides. I mean, we have this euphoric mood at iGEM. You know, I like iGEM because, you know, the jamboree aspect, it's like, a, it's, it's like scouting. And then you have this interesting, um, you know, word, uh, it's genetically engineered machines. And I think that's a very important word because you guys work with E. coli bacteria, and we do that for a long time, actually. I know that. So it's a big step towards a mammoth fund or a mammoth that uh, Dr. Church is, is, is doing, and then, of course, towards us humans. And there, there is the discussion. So yes, of course, film have to deal with, uh, with science. I mean, again, you know, we are in the same boat. We, we, we are breaking boundaries. We are going to the unknown. And we have to, our role is to be seismographs. Maybe you come a bit closer there. I'm sorry, Thanks I have a, a mark here. I didn't yeah, know apparently. that. You should have told me. It's like <laughs> I just got the signal film. now. <laughs> uh, so you just mentioned that so your next movie project you will be shooting in Wuhan. So uh, is it Well, I cannot go into that too much. Can, it's, what, what it's, can you tell bad, us? it's bad virology, which I'm interested in. And the whole you know, research they did for 15 years, uh, Cheng Li Shi, the research, is, she's a wonderful woman, on SARS, the original SARS. And I think it's an important story. Let's see where we get. So After the moment, it's the You can expect a Genesis 3.0 <laughs> well, as a movie. let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thanks sure. a lot. Okay, maybe I'll go. Thanks a lot, Christian. Maybe sure. sit down. So the next guest is uh, already online, I see, and uh, doesn't really need an introduction because everybody knows him already. I promised him I would make it as short as possible this morning, and it's actually impossible to make it really, really short. Basically, Dr. Professor George Church is a professor at the Harvard MIT. He's a founding member of the VIS Biology for Inspired Engineering in Boston. He, uh, he's, I had to write his Wikipedia site just this morning, so it started with uh, being a student at Duke University who worked hundreds of hours in the lab already, if Wikipedia is correct, in per week. Uh, he did his PhD with Gilbert, one of the founders of DNA sequencing. From sequencing, he went down into genomics, genetics, personal genome projects, and he is an inventor and co-developer of many techniques, and also further uh, things like nanopore sequencing, the people of you maybe know. So he's behind thousands of projects. So, ah, and he's already behind me. Voila, and with this, basically, I would like to welcome you, Dr. Church. Thanks a lot for being with us tonight. Can you hear me? Can you see me? We can't hear you yet. Can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, welcome. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thanks a lot. I just said thanks a lot for being with us tonight, and so maybe I'll go right away with the first question. We just watched the movie, and so it would be also nice to know from you what, uh, what you thought about the movie. Did you like the movie yourself? Uh, I, I loved it. It was uh, you know, very artistic, the way it would inter interleave the future and this uh, in incredibly uh, bizarre, primitive landscape with, with uh, men-machine hybrids going through uh, living, you know, eking out a living. And the, the, the dynamic between the use of, of uh, mammoths for, uh, for ivory and, the, and their use for uh, research and uh, the future. What about the more critical aspect of the movie? It also depicts some fears, right, that we just discussed with Christian. Did you also thought, thought they were proportionate? Well, I, think, I like fear mongering personally. Uh, I think that if we don't, uh, it's much better than to overstate the problems and then be pleasantly surprised at how uh, how lovely the 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 future is, rather than to underestimate and be uh, surprised, uh, sideswiped uh, by by something we didn't talk about adequately. So I tend to bring up these same topics myself. Uh, um, yeah, I thought it was interesting giving a, you know, it's really th three counterpoints, not just the two. <laughs> it's it's uh, this kind of this anachronistic harvesting of ancient tusks, and then the cloning, and then the um, uh, molecular uh, synthetic biology, 
to outsiders, the cloning and synthetic biology may look very similar, but to us, it's quite, quite different. Thank you. So to, to talk about the Wooly Mammoth project, so why is this one so famous? I mean, you have hundreds of projects, and, and what is it actually really about? <laughs> why do you want to bring back the mammoth? Right. Uh, well, it has many aspects, and the, the short version is that we want to uh, come up with a way of protecting endangered species. It's not so much about extinct ones, it's about those that are on the brink. And the Asian elephant is on the brink, partly because of a uh, herpes virus. So we're trying to make a new version, a very slight change to the, is, of the, to the elephant, so that it's resistant to herpes viruses, that it's adapted to the cold so that it can live further. An, another extinction force is human. They li most Asian elephants live very close to high human population density, while the Arctic is full of lots of space uh, where um, there's almost no human beings. And so that's an, a whole new homeland for them where their uh, cousins used to live. And then in addition to the species preservation of a modern species, there's also the, the restoration of, a, of a grasslands that would uh, sequester carbon better. And, and there's uh, 1,400 gigatons of methane uh, roughly at risk in the Arctic, much more so than, than any other part of the Earth, and dwarfing in comparison the tiny amount of carbon that humans use, which is about 10 gigatons. So it's 1,400 gigatons at risk, 10 gigatons per year that we use. And the longer story would, would, would explain exactly how the elephants and other herbivores play into uh, preserving that and restoring, reversing the carbon loss. But that's very interesting. So if I get it right, so you, you think that bringing back some sort of uh, woolly mammoth would help ca capture, capturing carbon, CO2, and helping to tackle climate change? Maybe you can still explain a bit how this that's, would work in a that's, nutshell. That's the hope. Uh, uh, if nothing else, it raises consciousness. But the hope is that it is scalable in the same way that the bisons, the bisons recovered, there were just uh, a, a tiny number of uh, remaining bison, almost a completely extinct, and now there's half a million uh, worldwide. So that's a similar thing could happen with uh, these cold-resistant elephants. And if so, then the then they the, 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 they could um, turn the trees into grass uh, that they, that used to be there not too long ago, and. The grass is much more friendly for the herbivores to pack down the snow in the winter so that the minus 40 air can get down to the plus 20 summer uh, dirt, tundra. Uh, um, and the, the grass is, is better at photosynthesis and it's better at reflecting uh, the, the light and heat. So in every way, or at least in those three ways, uh, the, that particular category of herbivore could, could uh, help us change from having too much carbon in the atmosphere to going back to closer to pre-industrial levels. Thank you for explaining this in a nutshell while trying. Then the uh, next question would be, so to zoom a bit out from the mammals, so this has said the attention has been very big also mediatically on this mammoth project, but as far as I know, you, you have many other projects. So can you tell us what, what else you are working on at the moment? I saw, and we saw together a picture of you that appeared, I think, in Nature last July, where we see you standing in the middle of a park with, I think, 100 members from a lab around you. So it looks like a huge lab. I, I, I read that you spun off 16 startups in 2018-19, which is huge. So what are, what, what is, what are all this diversity? Well, that picture of, of uh, 200 people, was that, that wasn't my current lab, that was uh, a reunion, so it, was, it looked bigger. Um, but we do have many projects, including these spin-off companies, which are kind of like an extension lab. We're working on um, uh, three, pro three different spin-offs uh, on machine learning for design of proteins. Um, we have uh, a couple involved in re reprogramming developmental biology, accelerating developmental biology, or accelerating evolution um, to produce new materials or organs for transplantation. Um, you know, many other projects I don't want to 
<laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I, I, another news I read recently, there was a, now of course there is the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and so I read you're also working on that. In, 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 is that true, uh, and is that more official? Uh, yes, so we've, we've uh, published uh, a significant fraction, we have nine papers in various stages of publication, most of them at least in preprint form, uh, on COVID-19 um, uh, in inhibitors, uh, vaccines, um, policy, and, and most important, testing. I think the, the most Im immediate way of of stopping this pandemic is via testing. We want to have home testing, which is essentially instant, um, and as well as centralized testing, which can can not only handle COVID, but um, uh, looking forward, as we should have been, uh, t towards pathogens in general. I call this the bioweather map, and I've been advocating this since about 2002, is that we are constantly monitoring as, uh, as the economics has improved about 10 million fold, we should be able to constantly monitor many different pathogens at once in our, our, our environment, in our mouth, uh, um, in zoonotic diseases that are emerging and so forth. If we had been doing that all along, we could have saved ourselves $10 trillion on this one disease alone. Um, and to come back a bit to uh, the Oh, move. so in addition to that, we're, we're, so that's uh, reading, and we're also doing uh, uh, novel vaccines and, and, and treatments. To come back a bit to the, to the movie now, to the topic of synthetic biology, and uh, what role has uh, iGEM for you now, when you look at it, how it evolved? Uh, we'll come back later also to iGEM with the team, but uh, what, what role does it have in your research? How do you see it evolving? Yeah, so, I mean, our uh, initiation of synthetic biology predates iGEM, but we were the, among the first teams uh, in the first year, 2004, 2005, uh, iGEM, and I've participated many years since then. It is, uh, I think, very inspiring, not just to the young people, but to, uh, to the pioneers and the older uh, folks uh, to see uh, the clever ideas, the enthusiasm, the future. You can see the future in their posters, in their eyes, and, and, and uh, speeches. So um, I think it's uh, um, one of the things I think is most striking about iGEM is we did not set it up to be a cutthroat competition uh, the way that some of the robotics uh, competitions were. We set it up to be something that had what we called human practices, where you, in order to get points or score, uh, you needed to think about the ethics, the legal, social ramifications, and do something about it. So that was actually just as much part of the project as uh, the molecular biology. And uh, going beyond the iGEM now, the, if you, the movie has been shot, I guess, in 15, 16, you said? came out in 18, so now we're again two years later. So how do you see the fields, synthetic biology, genetic engineering evolving from them to now? Has this uh, more and more and more, as was said in the movie, taken place? Uh, it, it is uh, an exponential. Both the reading and writing DNA are on an exponential that is probably quite a bit faster than the already alarming exponential of electronics, uh, telecommunications, internet. Um, some of it, 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 it is not immediately evident that it's on that exponential unless you're a researcher, but it, it uh, like the hockey stick or the, the curve, uh, you will notice it uh, at some point. And it's good to pay attention to it while it's still um, exponential but small rather than exponential and large. Um, there, there will be mo hopefully mostly positive outcomes because we are watching it so closely and there, is, there, there are uh, regulatory agencies like the FDA, the EMA in Europe, uh, EPA that protect the environment and so on. So, but we need to be very vigilant. So, uh, so the exponential is going and it's, I think it's be keeping pace with uh, uh, the regulatory components. 
Maybe one last question before I invite the iGEM winners and Professor De Planque. So uh, this exponential, so when we compare to computer sciences, it was also an exponential, but it basically hit the population or, or, the, or the broad public later. So is there some key event or moment that you think will, when really everybody will realize, not just researchers, but the broad audience, that it kicks really in, that everybody understands it? Well, some of the best technologies, Arthur C. Clarke said, look like magic, but some of the really best technologies are the ones you don't even notice. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, this is one of the most amazing medical devices, is a cell phone. It's also one of the best ways of, of navigating. Uh, and we, we take for granted the, the, the GPS satellites and the atomic clocks that go into it, uh, all, and not to mention the telecommunication satellites. So um, the idea is to make the, and you can see it in the film, Christian's film, uh, where the BGI tour is, is, is showing how many uh, women have, have taken advantage of the non-invasive prenatal testing, which at the time, four years ago, was uh, around two million. It's much more than that now worldwide. Um, so it's happening already. I mean, it's, we're, we're already getting so used to the revolution, we don't even see it. It doesn't mean we sh we shouldn't be transparent about it. We should make it very easy for people who want to learn about it, who want to regulate it, uh, maybe even want to slow it down. They should, they should be able to see what's going on. Uh, and that's why movies like this are terrific for dramatizing, engaging, and encouraging people to see what's actually going on in this revolution. But, but as you just said, to answer your question, it's, it, it's, it's already happening, it's pervasive. Yeah, but more subtle in that sense. I mean, the iPhone, as you mentioned, there was an iPhone moment, right? Early, early this sense. Right. Uh, so is, will the, there be a, the, a parallel? But the GPS snuck up on us, I think. Sorry? A little bit, you know. Say it again? I didn't hear it. The, the global positioning system that allows you to do maps was more sneakier than, than the iPhone. Mm -hmm. The iPhone was intentionally marketing, while the GPS was more like, all I care about is going right and left. I don't really care how many satellites there are and how precise the atomic clock is. Okay, so it's more like GPS revolution. <laughs> thanks a lot. Right. Great, so thanks a lot. You stay with us. We soon open the questions for the public. I would like now to introduce the two iGEM winners, Luc Gabel and Konstantinos Rajos, who should be here in the room. Yes, please come to the stage. And then Professor Barte Planket, Professor of Systems Biology and Genetics here at EPFL. You are into microfluidics, high throughput sequencing, and many other things. But here tonight, please take a stage. But tonight also, especially because uh, you are the founder of the iGEM team at EPFL, which in 2008 uh, then led to the history of participating nearly every year. Yes, you, you can sit down <laughs> or stand as you prefer. And then, basically last year, the, the overgraduate maybe, may, uh, basically won the international competition. This given also, as far as understood, iGEM started with about 50 people at the beginning, and now it's over five, 6,000 people, probably more. So I know it's not a so competitive place, but still they won with many other people. <laughs> so thanks a lot for being here. I would like also to ask you a few questions before we open then the microphone for the audience. Uh, you, mask, you should keep it on. Me yeah, you were alone before, so I would Does actually... Look like a COVID yet? No, not, not at all. Not at all. Now, because you were alone, I think now it would be better if you put it on again. Thanks a lot. Okay, so maybe same question to you, maybe very quickly. Did you like the movie? What did it... Uh, what effect did it have on you? Part. Um, yeah, I, I, I really liked the movie. I think uh, maybe adding to what was already said, what I really liked is uh, the symbolic nature of actually having these people sort of in the primordial grounds, as Christian said it very nicely. And this being symbolic to the fact that I think, you know, many people, I think the majority of people actually are, are somewhat positioned in their thinking on the primordial grounds. And then they look at these scientists and these big skyscrapers as, you know, the gods of the future. And I think there's a little bit of distrust that transpired through the movie, I think. Uh, and uh, I thought it was very symbolic at uh, the way it was illustrated that way. And uh, kudos also to Max Richter, who you know, is an amazing composer. So I think I want to quickly mention that as well, because it adds to the atmosphere 
of mystery. I don't think it's fear or dread, but I think it's mystery. And I think even the scientists are still a little bit up in the air as to what actually will, will, will come. But I was really happy that Dr. Olsen at least showed some indication of, of uh, ethics, because sometimes you know one has the impression that scientists are completely devoid of it. And unfortunately, I think the majority, the vast majority are not. And I think that also transpired. So I was really blown away by these contrasts, which actually really nicely uh, united actually the sort of trains of thoughts that are currently going on in society. Would you maybe like, uh, would like to hear also maybe Luc or Constantinos? What did you have? A, what did you feel, felt when you saw these 5,000 students in, embarking on the future? With uh, well, I would agree that sometimes we forget what's happening on the backstage. Uh, that there are people that don't get the claim, and that maybe have done so much work. And uh, I think. That was the biggest idea of the movie. Thank you. Maybe I can ask you then, uh, so tell us more about your iGEM project that won last year. So what did you try to engineer? What kind of machine? And why did it win, according to you? No, it's not working. Should be better yes, now? Good, yeah, no. okay. Sorry about that. Um, our project was a diagnosis, uh, diagnostics tool for a grapevine disease. So as you all know, Switzerland is um, a major wine producer. And for a few years in Europe, there is this disease called Flavescence Doré, which has been spreading um, throughout Europe and causing devastating damages to vineyards. So our project was to make a tool that could detect the disease very quickly, very cheaply, and effectively. So we spent, uh, well, several months working in the lab, uh, in Professor Merkel's lab, to develop this test. And, um, well, then, yeah, it was the, the iGEM competition, the jamboree, which, um, it was a bit emotional to see it again in the movie, <laughs> thanks for that. And yeah, so apparently our project was very well appreciated and we received the, uh, the grand prize uh, for the iGEM competition, yeah. Thank you. So if I understood, it's, it's, it's a, an organism that uh, detects a disease in wine yards, right? Inspired by Switzerland, but of course, whole Europe is a big wine producer. Can you maybe tell us a bit more how it works? So what kind of organism is it? Bacterium is it a... So we did not use a, um, a GMO. We used cell-free system, which is basically the idea is to take the components of a cell and, well, take it out, take it out of the cell. So it's, it has the advantages that your system cannot go out of control and just infect the environment unlike E. coli or yeast or uh, other GMOs. Yeah, so, yeah, do you have something to add? Uh, yes, we, the, the main idea is that we uh, detect a sequence uh, on the leaf, and we amplify the sequence, and uh, we add a color. So if the final solution is yellow, uh, that means that there is a present, the disease is present. Otherwise, it means that uh, it's not there. So we try to make something very simple, uh, something that doesn't require any training, uh, doesn't require any reading, any research, even the, uh, a farmer uh, can do it uh, in between other chores. Thank you. So I've understood it's, a, it's a, an engineered cell, and it's the inside of the cell, that the, the, the juice, if you want, that can be used as a test, as a quick test, to, to see if the, the, the grapes are infected. Yeah? Um, more or less. More, like okay. we don't not all our biologists in the room, so I try to... Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so Switzerland, of course, is not just famous for wines, actually also for, for synthetic biology, apparently, or for biology, for life sciences, for 
technology in general. So we are here exactly because of this, because you won the competition, because we have research like this in Switzerland, because we have critical views from the movie and the society. So, uh, Bart, maybe. So how do you see uh, genetic engineering, systems biology, uh, sorry, synthetic biology here at EPFL in Switzerland evolving? Um, I think there's, you know, I think with the iGEM competition, I think uh, they can confirm or, or, or reject, but I think we, we are able to enthuse, you know, make people more and more enthusiastic about the idea of actually engaging in this type of research. I think uh, with the, the help of iGEM-like competitions, you know, it's really a problem-solving uh, exercise that really allows you to kind of tackle problems that are relevant to society. And I think this is what we all care about, is to do something for society, whether it's for an individual or to, to solve an ecological problem or an economical problem. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the, with the innovations that also George talked about, uh, I think students are really aware that they are in a sort of critical period of time where there's so much going on also with the DNA and sequencing that here, being an engineering institute, I think uh, our students are really susceptible to this and I think are enthusiastic, thanks to iGEM, but also local initiatives then to actually engage in these type of projects. So I think the critical mass is definitely increasing and we see more and more students actually looking for these type of projects. Engineering life, I think, resonates with people and with, especially with students. So there's an increased momentum, I wouldn't say only in Switzerland, I think sort of all over the world. But I think, you know, we're exquisitely positioned here in Switzerland to really jump on that train and to really uh, look both at the positives and the negatives and actually make some really intelligent judgments on it. Maybe one, two more questions before I open for the audience. So you touched a very important point that we touched upon multiple times. So we do this for society. Of course, if we look back at the scene of the BGI and the, and the lady, they also do it for society. It was written in the movie that the, the state is part of owner of this. So we come back to the idea, we, we are a state-funded school, we do things for society, but how do we know what society wants, right? And uh, how do you, that, that's, that's maybe why I'm so interested also in movies, because movies are, are maybe amplifiers of what society thinks. So, yeah, what's your take on that? How do you know when you say we do the best for society? How do you know what society wants? I think that's a very difficult question. I think Harari once said that basically all of these innovations are not made in jumps, it's a sliding slope. And so, while on the one hand we want to actually improve society, you ended the movie with something bigger is awaiting, and I think we're all aware that this bigger thing has already happened in a way. So actually, you probably didn't even predict that it would actually happen so fast. Um, so I think it's going so fast that these type of movies actually force us to think about the problem and actually to sit together and think about the ethical ramifications of what we do and we should actually sort of uh, put some real thought process into this to, to make sure that we understand what could be good or bad. I mean, I always refer back, I think, or Dean here at the School of Life Sciences, Gizou van der Hoot, has sort of installed this Hippocratic oath that actually makes a life scientist think about the ramifications of what uh, of the experiments this person is doing, right? And I think that's the first step. And I think then we have to go into a more global debate with society as to what could be good and bad. But that's a collective decision. You know, we cannot do this alone, scientists. I think all parties, all layers of society need to be uh, presented. But, you know, what is really good is a very difficult question. And I think that's not only up to the scientists. Thank you. Maybe last question to you, Luke and Konstantinos. Will you participate again? Will EPFL participate again? How is uh, iGEM evolving? Will it take place in the US again? Um, well, this year was pretty hard uh, for um, uh, most of the teams and for uh, EPFL's team. Um, I'm participating as an advisor and uh, the team had to overcome a lot of uh, difficulties, but uh, I think uh, they will pull it through and deliver a great project. So this year, uh, the whole Jamboree will be hosted uh, online, and uh, hopefully from next year, it will move to Paris. Um, so we keep uh, uh, working, and if the situation uh, helps, helps us, uh, we'll continue to bring in uh, some glory to EBFL.
Thanks. Good luck and congrats again. I would like now to open now the questions for you from the audience. So there is there a, a mic. You can stand to the, to the mic and ask a question. So please go ahead, first question. Maybe address the question to somebody so it's clear. Mike? Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Great. So, so let's see. So I'll start just with two points on thoughts about synthetic biology. So, and I think this is generally to the whole panel. So if you could name the one invention that synthetic biology had until now that really had an impact in society that we couldn't um, think of, what, what would you name? And then the second point is, you know, if you are sort of like in those dark days and you're really afraid of everything related to synthetic biology, what is the one thing that you are really afraid of? Thank you. So I guess the question can be asked to Dr. Church and also Dr. De Planke. Did you hear the question? Yeah. Yes, I, I heard it. Uh, it. It it depends on how broad you want synthetic biology to be, but I, I think to some extent uh, it's synthetic. It's mostly synthetic molecular biology, um, and I would include the the uh, some of the ancient. Uh, you know, when you ask what's the biggest impact, it's going to be whatever is the oldest part of it that's had the time for society to adopt it, and I would say things like synthetic insulin made in bacteria, so it's human insulin made in bacteria, um, I think as, a, as an example, it's affected diabetics throughout the world. Um, I, think we're, we're, I think almost every solution to the COVID problem involves synthetic biology one way or another, whether it's a vaccine, a cure, or a, a, a diagnostic kit, uh, CRISPR. Okay, so I'm supposed to only pick one. Um, <laughs> The, you know, I think the greatest fear uh, actually is uh, that by that is the fear of not using a resource uh, that we can make mistakes, both uh, false positives and false negatives. We can uh, miss an opportunity when we have uh, 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet. Doing nothing is not a good option um, because the planet. Uh, with sort of primitive agriculture alone, uh, not pre-synthetic biology could not s sustain our population. So anyway, I think that, that opportunity loss is, is, a, is, a, is a, a huge risk. Thank you. Maybe Bart? Yeah, I, I would have reiterated also the fact that actually every, all the solutions that are being proposed for COVID are indeed sort of based on synthetic biology principles. So I think George pointed that out really well. I think I just want to add a little disclaimer also that I, I discussed with you, Mirko, that sometimes we confuse a little bit genetic engineering with synthetic biology. I think iGEM does that well by saying we're, you know, with synthetic biology, we want to genetically engineer a machine. You know, genetic engineering somehow is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a division of synthetic biology where we basically change the DNA uh, to, to, you know, change maybe a little phenotype or something like that, right? So, and there the fears are much more obvious. In synthetic biology, I think we're still sort of far away from realizing the dreams, but, you know, to put a machine together, I think we're sort of making the baby steps, but there's nothing really major still that actually is 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 uh, is uh, is on the horizon now but, but genetic engineering the crispr babies and so forth you know to answer uh, bruno's question this is of course you know uh, something that we were not ready for right as a society and that's 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 actually our responsibility right we should have sort of anticipated that and 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 reacted actually already preemptively right preemptively uh, so that's my biggest fear that basically because of those kind of actions it puts the entire field in a shadow, and uh, and and this is, is is detrimental to everyone. And I think uh, the society needs to get together fast, because as George has pointed out, the hockey stick is there. It's going to go only faster, and so the society needs to be brought on board. Thank you. Another question from the audience? Yes, thank you. Hello. Um, yeah, well, I have several questions. Uh, one is about the mammoth blood. What did it have to be liquid at that temperature so low? Did they finally analyze it and, and find it? This is a question for George Church? Uh, this is a question yeah, for I'll, whoever I'll, knows it. <laughs> okay. I don't know the answer. <laughs> uh, so the, the mammoth blood is uh, proteins... 
survive better. Uh, and to some extent, the color of the hemoglobin is mostly in the heme, which isn't even a protein. It's, so these are much more stable than the DNA. Um, the temperature, it, uh, it, these uh, excavations typically occur is at the melting point. So there's frozen components and there are liquid components. Uh, and uh, so the blood was at, was at you know, a, probably above uh, zero degrees uh, mm -hmm. centigrade. Um, but it's not real blood. It's not, it's not like there's necessarily intact uh, white blood cells there. There's just the hemoglobin protein in various states, states of uh, disrepair that's make it, that makes it the color. Okay, thank you very much. Another question is um, about this debate we need to have about the applications of synthetic biology or any technical advance. Um, you named, uh, I, I say this to Christopher, I, you named the documentary Genesis, and I think this is a very meaningful word for many people in the Western country, but in Asia, they, I mean, they are not Christ, Christians or Jewish, so they don't have the same background, they don't have, yeah, the same, let's say, yeah, the same cultural background as us, and I think that impacts heavily how we perceive the societies. So how feasible do you think it is to agree on something with them and understand their point of view and their, having them understanding ours? It's a question for you, Christian. So I didn't really get the second part. What, what is, because I'm, I got the Genesis part and the Christian point of view, but then you... Uh, yeah, so so uh, two, let's say, let's say two cultures that are so different in their background, and therefore, I think this shapes the way they, they think now. Do you think okay. it's possible to... Bring it together? Agree, yes, agree on something, because uh, inevitably, what we do will impact them, but what they do, it will also impact us. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it's much more than two cultures in this film, because as you've seen, the whole finale in the film, I was with Yakutian, a Yakutian researcher coming from South Korea going to Shenzhen. I was actually the only Westerner in there, you know, so I mean it's, 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 Asia is going their own way and we should also not just see us like Western thinking, I mean there's a new frontiers and it's very interesting. And then you have this other side, of course, with the myths and the taboos and all that. That's also frontier, which you now see with COVID, you know. I mean, it's amazing that every epidemic, pandemic, triggers the same rumors, conspiracies, hyperventilating media. It's coming every time like a clock. And it will be part of my film, you know, so I will be totally on another side. I will try to help scientists and to establish again a rational thinking. What is challenged actually, also now in times of COVID, is just that you have a basic trust in, in rational thinking and science. And I mean that, you know, it's really scary. So this is another thing. So in this, in Genesis, I was more, not on the esoteric side, as you have seen, but I was interested in the, taboo in Yakutian culture, also this poem I put at the beginning of the film, like you don't penetrate the earth. So we have also a gender thing, you know, why is in so many cultures the earth is a female connotation, you know, I mean, it's, it's just all over the cultures all over the world. It's interesting. I like my testosterone, I like being man, you know, but I think it is also an interesting that, that, you know, what does it mean to, to kind of this, this, this group of, of, of guys, you cannot imagine to have a, fee, a, a woman there. So it's another culture thing, you know, so I just want to open up your question. Mm -hmm. I think there's many cultures in these films and, and in this film, and I'm, I'm, I'm very interested for, uh, for the next film in really embarking just to the basic, like, calm down, let's just look at the bats, let's look what, what happened between 2003 and 2017 when they finally found in Yunnan province in China 
the one cave, you know, with the bats, with, with almost the same ingredient DNA, like uh, the original SARS number one. And the same group of people who were warning the world for, for like 13, 14 years, then were like, you know, kind of catapulted from the obscurity of the caves into this harsh spotlight of, of, of the world politics, rumors, conspiracies now. So this is the, the, what I would like to do. So I mean, I think it's multifaceted. I, I don't know if I answered your question right. Um, I tried. No, it was still interesting, but not really. So I, I, I'm going to try to close it a bit again. So I, especially about this scene in which uh, Dr. Olson was in the BGI talking to this lady and he had this, this concern about the Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And so for, for them, I think they, they don't have this, they don't see it as a problem. Mm -hmm. I get and your question now much yes. better. Yes, yeah. of course, I mean, he's even saying it, you know, in the film, from my Western point of view, this is kind of scary, you know. And, um, well, but I think it's, it's complex, you know, because, I mean, you know, after the CRISPR babies, I mean, there was a huge protest and they, they were really shocked in China. So it's not that one-dimensional, I mean. But, yeah, I mean, I cannot embark now on the China debate, not publicly, because I want to cooperate with them for the mm -hmm. next film. So Thanks a lot. So maybe we go for more questions. I think there's somebody moving there closer. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you for the mic time. Thank you, Christian, for the movie. I think it was really enlightening to see um, how you managed to bring um, this vision of what is happening in the science and also in the remote north part of uh, Siberia. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting for me to observe that in China, there, there is this fascination with uh, dragons and they, they had this strong belief that they could become better human if they engineered the genome. So it has a kind of echo of the story of the Garden of Eden and the, the snake telling, uh, you, you should be like God, so it was interesting. But my question was more about um, the um, hybrid animals that we saw in the beginning, because to me, it was mostly like, a, a horse and a zebra and a lion and a tiger, but these are of the same kind of animals. But is there any kind of hybrid between, I don't know, a cow and a horse or a dog and a cat, which are quite different, genetically speaking? So as far as I read on Wikipedia, I think Dr. Church also studied zoology at yeah. Duke, so maybe you can answer that question best. <laughs> uh, there, there are certainly uh, you know, graphs, you can do a transplantation between plants of very different species and, and even animals. Uh, we are transplanting organs from pigs into humans uh, because there's a, a shortage of organs and the, and the organs can uh, be resistant to diseases as well um, if, they're, if they're engineered. So uh, that's probably the, the most cutting edge uh, aspect of it. It's, a, it's an idea that's over 20 years old, but it's mm -hmm. now uh, being, uh, um, it's very, very close to, to uh, clinical trials. Okay. And maybe you have another question? One, yeah, maybe one last one. Um, last year, um, I went to, uh, I listened to a conference from a, a geneticist as well, and he was speaking about genetic entropy, how the genome is like degrading generation by generation, but I don't know too much about that. So is, is this something, an issue that's for all species that could cause extinction or not really? So genetic entropy, maybe again? Dr. Yeah, probably talking, probably talking about uh, evolutionary time changes in the Y chromosome. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, this happens in many species, not mm -hmm. just the human. Uh, it doesn't result in extinction, it results in just uh, change. Uh, um, and it's very slow and it's, uh, mm -hmm. and in the modern times, it's, it's even subject to our own uh, influence, while in the past it was only subject to Darwinian um, natural selection. Mm, okay, thank you.
Thank you. Thanks a lot. Maybe there's some more. Exactly. I see some more questions from the audience. Yeah. Hello. Um, I had a question to Mr. Church, uh, Dr. Church, sorry. Uh, you talked about the very fast and sometimes worrying mediatic and technological development, and you compared it to the ongoing revolution happening now in the field of uh, synthetic biology. Um, in, the, in the film, we see the obvious risks, but also, also the benefits uh, of genome sequencing. Uh, And I, I asked myself, what convinced you in taking part in the BGI project? Maybe could you tell a bit more a bit exactly how you're implied in the project? And what are your thoughts about the genome sequencing? Well, I think at some level, BGI joined my project, <laughs> is another way of thinking about it. Uh, I, you know, I, I've been working on sequencing uh, since 1977. Uh, BGI started getting serious about it in, uh, at the dawn of the Human Genome Project uh, in the late 90s, actually. Um, uh, I've en enjoyed working with them that, that because they uh, are um, capable of pivoting and quickly uh, developing new technology. They uh, acquired one of my other companies uh, called Complete Genomics, a California company and have used that to uh, bring out a whole new generation of, of sequencing that's extremely low cost on the order of somewhere between $100 and $300 per high quality clinical grade human genome when it used to be $3 billion for a poor quality non-clinical grade uh, genome. Um, I could go on about, uh, they've also contributed a number of genomes for free for, for public for public use uh, that are open access, which is something you don't see very often from uh, some of the other technologies. So I, they're just, they're, I could go on, but that's, that's the, the simple answer. Thank you, thanks a lot. Thank you. So maybe one, two more or less questions from the audience, if there are, yes, I see moving. One, two, perfect, then we, okay, three, then we close. Uh, hi, George. Uh, so maybe to open up the discussion, uh, maybe we could ask about some of the future technologies that will shape synthetic biology, especially if enablers such as enzymatic DNA synthesis become very cheap and enable the production of very large sequences. What do you think will take off in the next 10, 20 years? Uh, will we first see a true designer pro prokaryotes or just further progress with mammalian cells. Thank you. And that's also for Professor DePlanck. Okay, so Dr. Church and then Dr. DePlanck. Well, why don't we let Dr. DePlanck start? Okay. With, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, Bart, not, I mean, I just want other people to talk. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity, yeah. Uh, I think uh, for me, actually, most of the, of the advances Uh, will be uh, in the area of prokaryotes, bacteria, where basically the genomes are much smaller, DNA synthesis becomes much cheaper, and so rather than requiring life cells of a mammoth, basically we have already shown that it is actually possible to synthetically put the genome together that is not that large and that we can transplant in, in a bacteria. I mean, Craig Venter has shown that, and I think there we have a huge, uh, huge ecological challenges you know, cleaning, waste, uh, you know, nuclear waste, all these kind of things. And I think, to me, in the next 10 or 20 years, these sort of re-engineered bacteria or machines, not truly synthetic biology, because we're sort of using still the original genome as the major template. Uh, so these are not the true synthetic biology machines that I think we're still dreaming of, but at least these re-engineered bacteria can now do um, can have properties that basically do not exist today, but we can make them to work in a controlled fashion to actually deal with some of the major ecological challenges on this planet. So to me, in the next 10 or 20 years, and hopefully with George's help, <laughs> these, these guys will come online, and I think that will be very exciting, as long as, of course, we also have a switch off, you know, an, an off switch in these bacteria to, to sort of understand their proliferation Uh, and also control them when they're running, you know, 
uh, a little bit berserk, right? So I think that's all the kind of things we have to think about, but at least in that domain, I see a lot of progress coming. So we have from, from engineered bacteria to mammoths that will help tackle climate change. <laughs> Maybe Dr. Church, yeah? Yeah, I, I just uh, would point out that we're, we are already well beyond bacteria. I mean, I'm a big fan of, uh, of microbial systems as well. But for example, with pigs, pigs we've done roughly what we want to do with elephants already, uh, where we've made 42 different changes in their genome. It's a very large number. Now, you could say we haven't synthesized them from atoms, but it, practically speaking, synthetic chemistry is not about synthesis from atoms. It's, it's grafting together molecules that are uh, convenient, economical, and so forth. And the same thing, I think, is true for so even the most synthetic of synthetic genomes, the most, even the most synthetic genome we've imagined is really an edited genome. Uh, we can synthesize them from scratch if we choose to, but conceptually, it's just a few changes. Uh, the most changes that we've ever made uh, in a genome is, uh, is 4% uh, of the changes. We did it by complete synthesis, but it was still only 4% change. So anyway, the pigs are heavily edited. The, the elephants will be as well. Um, we're making even a larger number of changes in human cells to make them multivirus resistant so that we can make, say, transplant hematopoietic stem cells so that all of our, um, all of our blood cells are resistant to all viruses. That's getting close to the maximum number of changes in the hundreds of thousands of changes, but it's still not. Um, it's still traceable to, uh, to pre previously existing organisms' genomes. Thank you. Uh, two questions more, and then we have to slowly uh, wrap guess, up. I guess it's a kind of uh, evolution biology question to Dr. Church. I mean, you mentioned that your research has also impact on endangered species, and uh, I, I believe that uh, DNA sequencing of ancient DNAs bear a lot of uh, technical uh, <clears throat> difficulties. I mean, it has been shown from mummion DNA, for instance, sequencing Egyptian by Swante Pebo, that there was, you know, a lot of gaps around. And so my first question was, how far are you actually to set up a bona fide uh, mammoth's uh, genome sequence? And second, based on that, since it's a species that is extinct, can you make prediction with uh, uh, <clears throat> elephant that are currently also endangered by current uh, global warming and climate change based on, on, on those sequence uh, comparisons? Uh, right, well, I, I think there's a danger to recreating an ancient species, especially if you do it blindly because there are ancient viruses in those genomes. So I, I, I prefer uh, being inspired by individual genes that we do understand. So, we un so at least uh, two genes have been brought back, uh, uh, resurrected, and uh, we understand how they confer cold resistance. This is the hemoglobin gene that, that allows the blood to exchange oxygen at, at close to zero degrees, close to the freezing point, and the TRIP-V, three gene that, that affects our, uh, the, the nervous system's ability to deal with uh, cold sensing. Uh, I think if we do it on a case-by-case -case where we uh, add genes as needed, uh, we're, we're safer than if we um, uh, bring back the, the entire genome without, uh, without thinking about it. We can also make them, uh, th th this global warming is something they can help solve, but it isn't necessarily something that stops them from repopulating. The temperature in Siberia is still minus 40 degrees over, you know, about 19 million square kilometers. So there is, it's one of the biggest ecosystems. It is very, very cold. So uh, it doesn't mean that there aren't 1,400 gigatons of carbon at risk that could, that could be, uh, um, solved by uh, the right herbivore, um, like a cold-resistant elephant. But I think the cold-resistant elephants would have a very large homeland uh, if we were successful. Um, you can't predict everything, but engineering is not, I think there's a, 
perhaps an overemphasis on how much engineering is about theory and prediction and how much of it is sweat and, and trial and error. And I think there is a lot of trial and error that goes into uh, uh, cell phones. And there's, a lot, there's even more trial and error you can do in biology because with biology you can make billions of uh, prototypes uh, in, the, in the form of cells. Uh, while it's hard to make billions of different uh, designs for, say, a bridge or a car. Thank you. We come to the last question. I think there was a lady. You're still... Yeah? <laughs> Please, go ahead. Oh, um, actually, I'm oh, sorry. not asking a question. <laughs> sorry. You're not the first one. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, uh, I'm actually from the previous iGEM team, so sorry taking your job, Constantino and Lux. I'm not here to ask a question. Uh, as the BGI kind of become a quite hot stop, uh, subject tonight, I kind of want to share some of my aspects uh, from as I'm also Chinese. So, um, I'm, I myself, when I watching the video and see the reaction of that lady in the institution by saying like, how can we eliminate the Down syndrome in the future? I also feel scared, scared and uncomfortable. But at the same time, um, and also for answering the question raised before, it's not like two cultures are actually going against each other and cannot understand each other. I think it's just in different stages. For example, um, in China back, let's say five or six years ago, with a one-child policy, you have a children who has a Down syndrome in your family. That's a very, that rise a, a lot of realistic problems. You, you might not have incomes when you're becoming old, and uh, the, the social discrimination of uh, having a Down syndrome children in your home, that's, our very, that's very harsh and real problems you're, you're going to face. So, mm, but if we raise the problem nowadays, if uh, you're going to have a Down syndrome children, um, I think most of the Chinese family will say, well, it's uh, still acceptable. I mean, we have the condition to raise that child. It will bring um, more joy to the family as, um, as he is. So uh, it's really, I think it's the different stage of thinking. So maybe if we ask this question again in China, and in the movie, like we can, we can tell, the lady is very uh, confident to announce that we have the ability to test Down syndromes and maybe eliminate. And the, the fact that he's confident is because he thinks it's a good thing. And I think for most of, most of science development, it all begins with like a very beautiful view. Like for example, if we have this technology, if we can uh, predict um, a children is Down syndrome or not before he's giving birth, uh, he is giving, given birth, we can, um, maybe prevent tr these kind of tragedies from that family. And uh, even for us, when we are uh, starting to work on our project, I think the main driving force is not what actually it will have the function like in the, in the future. It's more like the possibility, like we have a leaf and uh, with that leaf we, ha we can do some simple operation on it and within a few hours we know if it's infected or not. That kind of possibility is, is, is something that triggers us to, to go forward in science. So yeah, so it's not like two cultures, West and Eastern, go, East, uh, go against with each other. It's just we are uh, going forward and in the future, I think um, it, it's in the same routes we are going to meet in the end. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this uh, alternative point of view. That's excellent. It really makes the point also, and I think closes a bit the circle uh, in the sense also we talked before, for society, for which society, how does society see it? Different sides see it differently. Also the, the question before, Genesis is a biblic name. It's a Western European name. It doesn't necessarily talk to everybody. It's already a point of view. So, but with this, I would like to uh, maybe make just a very quick last round. If somebody has something to add or to comment, please now. You have something to would like to add? Sometimes in these discussions, there's something you'd like to get rid of. 
No, I, I just wanted to, I mean, in all fairness to the lady, I think, you know, she's of course a spokesperson of an institute, and when you raise those questions, you're sort of often blocked because there's all kinds of thoughts <laughs> running through your head, your own personal opinion, and then the institute's opinion, and then sort of you're staring. The calm guy. <laughs> which I'm sure if, if this lady would be here, I think she would be ha having a, a much more eloquent explanation as to what is going on. Uh, so I think we've all been facing, actually, even, you know, having children myself, I think I remember with my wife that actually, you know, because Down syndrome, you actually don't need genetic engineering, synthetic biology just to, to know whether you, have, you will have a child with, with Down syndrome. And I remember actually having done the test, suddenly it dawned on me that, oh, actually, that means we would have to make a decision. You know, if this comes out as positive, right, um, we have to make a decision. And I think at all, one point, I think the society needs to make a decision. Um, you know, it's not only up to us as to scientists, you know, because being a bit provocative, I have one of my best friends has a brother who has Down syndrome and is absolutely a beautiful person, right? On the other hand, I always say also, you know, who wants to replace that person and start his or her life again, but as a Down person, right? And, and, and you know, we can have large discussions about this, but I think this is a problem we need to solve as a society. Uh, and, and I just, well, anyway, so this is a larger discussion, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to defend this lady a little bit. Sure. And I'm very happy that this Chinese person also actually sort of spoke up and said, this is not only a conflict of, of, of two cultures, I think it's a worldwide problem that we need to actually address as a society. And I think many visionary thinkers can lead the way and can provide some ideas, but then as a society, we need to consolidate and sort of come with a conclusion, right? Thank you. Christian, you want to add something? No, I really like to listen now because I made the movie and I, I, I agree. I mean, I really agree. You know, uh, being a seismograph doesn't mean that we are not kind of, you know, we are thieves as documentarists <laughs> in order to give. <laughs> uh, but we, I mean, it's interface is more than just her being a, a, a spokesperson. There is some sincerity also because, of course, what's, what's the... Most important thing is that what, what should happen is what, what was happening here is a real dialogue because when, you know, both sides, like you have it sometimes with big companies, you know, the only people you can speak with as a journalist or a filmmaker is the spokespersons. And then you, get, you have this, you know, surface stuff which, which is not triggering anything. And I think I really, I, I really felt great to tonight and I would like to thank you Mirko and uh, EPFL for inviting me as an artist, as a filmmaker. I'm ready for the dialogue and we really should embark uh, and continue this, this dialogue. I think it's really important. Thank you so much. Before I give you the closing word, Dr. George Church, I also want to thank you because uh, exactly as you said, I'm representing communication. We are the spokespeople. We are dealing with this every day. And as mentioned, the president at the beginning, we would like to change this spin a bit and exactly have this discussion too come closer to society. George Church, an ending word would be beautiful from a visionary. Well, I think, uh, I, I think I just want to say something about conclusions. Uh, it is true that we will have a societal discussion about many of these exponential technologies. I'm not convinced we will reach a conclusion, however. Uh, we will conclude this discussion right this minute, but uh, um, Many technologies are still not uh, in a consensus mode. There are many people who will not drive cars, that will not uh, use medicines. There are some people who have rejected all technology, hundreds of such uh, societies, typically on islands or forests. Um, and I think that's good. I think that diversity is a better conclusion than necessarily consensus uh, on, a, on a new technology. Um, and just one last point on the, on the Down syndrome. If you imagine it, rather than being replacing a person, replacing a chromosome, let's say I had a drug that could dial up and down the number of chromosome 21s that I have in my body. Am I going to choose to have three of them in most of my cells, or am I going to choose to have two of them? in most of my cells. That's a very different conversation than someone making a decision during in vitro fertilization. But it, I think it illuminates the, the choice that we will have in the world of synthetic biology. 
Thanks a lot. Great concluding words. Thanks a lot for having been with us tonight, George Church. Thanks a lot, Christian Frey, for having come from Zurich, Barthe Planke, Luc, and uh, Konstantinos. Thanks a lot to you, artists and scientists, for embarking into the unknown, as we saw in the movie. And thanks to you, to the audience, for having behaved so well and asked all these nice questions. I hope we can have more events like this. The discussion will be online on the EPFL channel of YouTube and Vimeo. And uh, see you next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you.